Hi and welcome back. I wanted to redo my first video on this game because I really wasn't satisfied with it. So I'm going to start over and hopefully this time I will do a better job. Okay, the game is Cromwell. It's copyrights 1976 by Simulations Design Corporation. The original game idea was Leonard Canterman and Doug Belaforte. The game design and development is by Dana F. Lombardi. Playtesting is Jack Green with the assistance of Fred Webster and local Southern California Wargamers. The historical research is by Robert Gannett and Andrew Smith. And the graphics by David R. Haig and Dana F. Lombardi. The rules to the game come in this 32 page booklet um, format. It's printed in black and white on semi-glossy paper. It doesn't have uh, very many illustrations in it and I find the rules somewhat uh, Mm, opaque and hard to find the information that you're looking for but I guess it does an adequate job we have some illustrations of the various playing pieces such as cavalry, militia, pikemen, musketeers leaders um, and there are also yeah the militia so it uh, it's functional and does its job, however, it is a little unclear in places. So, the map is a paper map using area movement. The uh, colors represent the areas of control by the combatants at the start of the game. Green is the parliamentarian areas and brown is the royalist areas which they initially control. The reddish units are royalist player units and the purplish units are royalist player. I did say parliamentarian for the red and uh, royalist for the purple. Anyway, the map of the, the map used in the game has various types of information printed on it. Let's see here. In uh, Devonshire we have two numbers. This is kind of the resource value if it's controlled by the Royalist player and this is the resource value if controlled by the Parliamentarian player. We also have up here a fortress and it is <clears throat> in the parliamentarian players control and it will produce one resource point plus it will produce one militia point if it is uh, attacked by the royalist player. It is also a port space denoted by the anchor. Areas like South Wales when they have their name printed in white they, it's considered a difficult terrain and will cost double the normal movement point cost to enter it. Each area basically just has a uh, a one cost one to enter. Except you know if you're going from Shropshire to North Wales, it's going to cost you two basically, and into South Wales two more. So the map also has over here, hopefully, various charts and tables on it. I'm just going to be looking at the ones down here on the mm, parliamentarian side, I suppose. It has a melee table. I'll kind of move this over here a little bit more if I can. Melee table for use when units are just fighting out in uh, open areas. And it's also used if you cannot get enough factors to fight a fortress assault um, when you're attacking fortress areas. 
Uh, it also has a cavalry melee table and the fleet melee table. Yes, the game does have some naval rules. The charts, uh, or the turn track, goes around the map. Let's see if I can back out here a little bit. It goes completely around the map. There is a battle board if you wish to fight out certain battles in, uh, in a tactical format. Um, that's about all I can really say for the map at the moment. I'll go on here in a minute and describe the counters. Here's a brief look at the some of the different types of counters used in the game. The top unit is a cavalry unit. In the next row we have a musketeer and a pikeman and in the last uh, of the group we have a leader. I'll zoom in just a hair. The values on the counters, <clears throat> these are parliamentarian units. Um, they're denoted in red. The two um, signifies the number of strength points. They're used like change, so I could split that up into two ones or, you know, whatever. The pikemen are, and the musketeers are the same. The numbers are their combat, uh, uh, their strength points. And the last is the leader. His name is down here at the very bottom where it's extremely hard to read. This is Fairfax, and he has a combat bonus of plus two. I know it's pretty hard to read, but trust me. focus or not. Let's see if I can keep my hand steady enough. Somewhere in that area. Well, anyway, trust me, it's Fairfax. He has a plus two. Uh, combat m modifier. Alright, each unit type has a different movement point allowance based upon what type of area it's going to be moving into or through and obviously what type of unit it is. So, units moving through friendly areas, that's all areas that are their color that they own, including captured enemy areas that they have control over. Cavalry will have six movement points per turn. Therefore, they can go six friendly areas per turn. We'll start down here in Dorset. Let's say, start in Dorset, and it can go like, what, one, two, let's see if you're going to be able to see this whole movement, and then three, four, five into Kent and then it can go up to Essex I guess this doesn't there's no barrier for <clears throat> uh, rivers and that type of thing so and they go up there for six so let's say it starts in Plymouth again or let's say it starts in Plymouth and down here yes let's say it starts in Plymouth and it wants to move to Somerset or anywhere into its friendly controlled areas. It cannot move. It cannot enter an enemy controlled area, whether there are enemy units there or not. So, in that case, it can only, units may only enter an enemy controlled area if they have a leader. So he would have to have a leader with him in order to move into an enemy controlled area. So we will do that and in addition or this will tell us uh, what his movement rate is entering into enemy territory so to speak. So that's over here. He can move into different uh, a variable number of enemy areas per turn and that is four for cavalry with a leader. So at any point that he enters an enemy area 
his movement points drop from four to six. So anything that he has spent before that is deducted immediately. And if that prevents him from moving into the area, then he cannot move into it. Or, well, the rules are kind of unclear on that. Obviously, if you moved into it, you'd have enough points, if, even if the points changed. Um, well, I'll have to clarify that. I'm not 100% sure on that. But anyway, he could only move four, so coming over here again. He can move into Devonshire. That will cost him one, and he has a leader, and that's fine. But now he's down to four movement points. So instead of being able to tra traverse <clears throat> to traverse, you know, the entire southern England there through parliamentarian control. He, uh, so of being able to move six, he can only move four now. So, he could go like, you know, what? One, two, three, and then into hull, let's say, for four. Um, both of the, both units are restricted, both the leader and the, uh, cavalry unit. And, you know, that's kind of vice versa type of thing. Infantry and pikemen, which I guess I have to switch back over here real quick. If they started in Plymouth, they would also have to have a leader to enter an enemy controlled or occupied, an occupied or enemy controlled area. Yeah, so they, as denoted here, they have a three going into per turn if they enter an enemy area or four if they're just moving through friendly areas so they'll have three so it's going to cost them if I can keep up with the action here zoom out maybe yeah, let's try that so these guys can move one now basically they only have three movement points instead of four let's say two and three and they make it to Dorset the leader, even though he <clears throat> has more movement points, can drop them off because he has four if he enters an enemy area. So he can continue for one more space if he wishes. He can move into, what, Wiltshire, Hampshire, um, if he wanted to. And, but he's going to stay with these units, I would imagine, because he provides a bonus combat so that are that's a look at the units and some of their capabilities combat I'm gonna try and detail movement a little bit more perhaps if I can in addition the combat point values work in a similar way I know this will be kind of blurry at this <clears throat> range but I can't get much closer to the uh, board due to this obnoxiously large and unwieldy tripod. So here we can see the type of combat is listed on the far left side and the point values for the different types of units, say militia, pikemen, musketeers, and cavalry are listed at the top. <clears throat> so Let's say I have two parliamentarian units, a pikeman and a musketeer, and they're going to try to attack a fortress. And it's guarded by, oh, I don't know, let's say a cavalry unit. If any units attack or defend in a fortress, first of all, the units in the fortress are tripled. The combat value is tripled. And um, so it doesn't matter. This is the table used for that unless there's insufficient odds to initiate a fortress assault. So you would look and see what the combat value is for the cavalry and subsequently the ones for the attackers, the musketeer and the pikemen. So moving over, coming down, pikemen have two combat um, points per strength point. So that'd be one times two is two. 
musketeers attacking or defending have one times four or four. So you'd go you're looking at four, five, six. They have six points that would be attacking the fortress defended by the cavalry unit. Uh, cavalry unit has two combat factors um, per strength point. So it would be two. So what have we got? Six to two, that'd be three to one. However, units in a fortress are tripled. So what we would be considering here is he has a three times two for a six. So you'd be looking at a one to one attack on the fortress table. Um, so that's kind of how you total up the different combat odds based upon the units or combat strengths based upon the combat strength points of the unit. Um, down here, if we have any other areas and there are odd factors of pikemen and musketeers, we would use this line. And the most common one would be this one, equal numbers of pikemen and musketeer factors. And you can use the higher value over here if you have any cavalry units in the hex, or space, sorry. So if we were fighting what would basically be, be kind of like a, uh, just a regular battle in, the, um, in an area, these units now, because they're combined together, can use this row instead of this row, where there would be an odd number, such as, oh, that. They have to use this combat line, or line which is <clears throat> going to give them less firepower, or whatever, combat power. So, we have equal numbers of uh, muskets and pikemen, and they don't have any cavalry with them, but they still use this table. If they had cavalry, like I said, they'd be using the eight. So, now we have one times four is four. We have one times six is six. So you've got, what, ten? And the cavalry, they're still going to be pretty tough. Um, so they're going to be a six, six times one is six. So you're still looking at, what, ten to six. That's still a one-to-one -one attack. So anyway, that's just a brief uh, overlook at both movement and combat. I'll try, like I said, go ahead and look a little bit deeper into movement and various movement options and combat. There is also... These areas, like I said, are kind of like resource points. They call them eco-pole points, you know, economic, political points. Where are we at? Like Lancastershire is one. And up here, can't really see it, but... <clears throat> um, Yorkshire, the fortress there, is worth three points to the um, royalist, but worth two points to the parliamentarian. So, anyway, if the royalist owned it, it would be worth three points. Anyway, you total all those up and you can buy units based upon uh, uh, the various costs of the units. And in fact, you do that at every winter turn. Every winter turn, all your units are taken off the board. The royalist player marks the places he's controlled with um, any kind of marker. They say you use pennies, but I have some blank counters. Plus, I have some counters from Axis and Allies, so I use those to just mark it, mark the royalist gains, <clears throat> and then you just you know count those all up, uh, rebuild your army in secret, and then you place them down in any areas that you control. Um, this kind of represents the armies disappearing over winter and rebuilding them for the next uh, year's campaign seasons. Anyway, I'll be back in a minute to do a... I don't know if I nearly... Well, I'll go over into <clears throat> the movement because there's a couple other nuances. And then we'll run an example of combat. And I think we'll probably call it good for that. That should give a pretty good look at the game. There are three levels to the game. Intermediate, well, what I'm going to call introductory, basic, and um, advanced. Advanced gives you things like the ability to use navies and siege artillery and stuff like that. 
and the other rules just basically teach you the basics and get you started. So anyway, I shall return in a little bit. Okay, let's take a brief look at naval movement. I know I should probably just start with regular movement, but uh, I'll go ahead and do naval movement because I've already played, oh, not even a whole turn. So I've moved my units um, from their initial starting positions. However, the units here under Fairfax, they do not start the 1642 historical scenario, but I'm going to use these as an example um, during the movement example. Uh, the other units do and will, they do start on the map, but like I said, I've changed their position, so anything you see is not really according to the setup um, after one half a turn. So, for naval movement, you need a ship, a fleet. I'm not sure, I guess I should have picked up on this before I even started. Let's see. Okay, dokey, okay, dokey, let's see. Fleet, tra fleet units may transport friendly land units, leaders, cavalry, musketeers, pikemen, and siege artillery. Uh, they can be transported by fleets. Militia may never move or leave the area they start in. Fleet, one fleet factor may transport two pikemen, one musketeer, one cavalry factor, or one siege artillery factor. And fleets can move from one friendly port to another friendly port in one turn, one move. They can move from a port to an adjacent sea area and then stop, or they can move from an adjacent sea area to a port, or they may move, if they're at sea, from an adjacent sea area to another sea area. Um, leaving a port, such as London, into an area such as the English Channel is fine. However, if the English Channel contains an enemy fleet that is basically blockading the ports there, then they have to stop movement. They can't just, you know, or if they were in an enemy area, they'd have to stop upon moving <clears throat> in. If they were in an enemy sea or channel, they would have to stop moving upon entering uh, another sea with enemy fleets. So unless the port is, or the sea area is basically blockaded, you know, you can go from port to sea or sea to sea or whatever, port to port. In this case, it's just a parliamentarian player that has any units uh, or any fleets. So he's going to pick up two pikemen. Or er, no, it's going to be two, two musketeers, sorry. And we are going to move from port to port. We're going to go from London into the English Channel and over here to Portsmouth and drop off the musketeers in the fortress. The reasoning for that is I want to take Portsmouth and hold it you know, I want to hold Portsmouth against Hopton and his uh, musketeer unit, who could just move in there during the Royalist players' movement, which occurs during this, you know, following the Parliamentarian players' movement. The sequence of play is basically, <clears throat> depending upon the turn on the combat results table. One month the Royalist player will move, next month the Parliamentarian player will move, and vice versa up until winter time. Um, so at the beginning of the game in 1642, September, the Parliamentarian player has the initiative, so to speak, and they move first. Then the Royalist player will do a second, will do the second move in that turn, and combat and all that stuff. So, I know that's hard to explain, but <clears throat> it is easier in practice. So, we drop off the two musketeers, life is good, the fleet stays in the port, and that secures um, Plymouth for the Royalists of, uh, until, you know, they can either reinforcement, reinforce it or 
that it looks threatened threatened by a Royals player. Now, we're just going to do uh, we're going to just show a normal movement, kind of like I did before. Where did I put those forces? I put them right here in Hampshire. They did not start on the board either. And I kind of already went through this, but I want to kind of clarify it, I guess, for my own sake. Using the movement chart off to the left, which is not in frame, I know that moving through my own areas will give me a six, uh, six for cavalry and leaders, and four for the pike musk, pikemen and musk. Tears. So, excuse me. If I so chose to do so, I could move out of Hampshire, which is where I was. I was at Portsmouth. But anyway, uh, Hampshire, we could go up to Berks, to Buckingham, to Bedford. Where are we at? What is that? One, two, three, four to Cambridge. And just come back down here to Essex for five and one more to Kent. We want to take that type of route. And that's fine because we're moving. Well, I can't go six, can I? I only have four. Back back to Cambridge. We stop at Cambridge. Now the leader could continue on with the cavalry if he wished. By just dropping these guys off and moving two more, like say into Kent or back through, you know, back through Buckingham or whatever. So that's kind of an idea of moving through uh, areas that <clears throat> you control um, at the start of your movement phase. Now, yeah, London keeps its two. Don't want to mess up. Uh, don't want to mess up my count there. That would be disastrous. Now we have. I'm starting in. Let's put them in Hampshire. Where they kind of started at. Okay, this is movement into contested areas or, yeah, enemy areas. Uh, if they choose to do so, then their movement rates will be reduced. So that will reduce them if they do enter down to the. Um, the reduced movement rate, I guess. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. So let's say they start off with six for the cavalry and four for the uh, footmen. They'll go one, two, and they're trying to get over here to Cornwall. Well, now they spent two, and they're going to enter an enemy area. So now at this time, we have to drop down to the enemy area movement rates. And you only, you know, it only, you only pay that cost once. So no matter how many enemy areas you enter, you're still going to pay that reduced cost once you enter the initial one. So, now we're going to drop down to four areas per turn for the cavalry, and, uh, where am I at? Um, and three for the infantry, or footmen. So we started here, one, two, and now we only have uh, one point left for the footmen, and two, we have four for the uh, horsemen, basically. So, the horsemen would be one, two, three out of their four, and the footmen would be one, two, and three, and they would, they stop. You stop no matter what when you enter an enemy area, whether it's occupied or uh, controlled. Is that true? Yeah, I think so. Um, so that's kind of an idea there. They don't have the movement points to make it to Cornwall to engage the forces there in this turn. So that's kind of like what that is. So basically it's a free move through your own areas, you know, it's your maximum movement. If you enter an area with uh, enemy units, uh, uh, an enemy area, whether they have enemy units or not, you have to stop. Uh, but if you're entering through enemy areas or whatever that don't have units, you will slow down at your uh, reduced movement rate. I know that's hard to explain, but so let's say that Hampton here had moved in and captured Somerset. 
and I have units that are trying to get to Devonshire and to Hull, or let's call this Hull. Hull's up north. This is Plymouth. So I can start in Wiltshire, Shower, Wiltshire, Wiltshire, and we can move right into here with or without a leader. Because the units, even though they're there, they do not control the area at this time. Let's say they just moved in. Now I get to move. I move in. So nobody, we still control the original area. So we can enter into that and still use our normal um, friendly areas per turn uh, movement rates. And then we'd hit here and we drop down to our enemy um, areas per turn movement rate and continue on into uh, Plymouth or whatever. Um, I'm not sure. I think you need a leader to enter any enemy space or any space occupied by an enemy force. So I don't think we could put the pikemen and the muskets in there by themselves. Or can we? Yeah, I think we can. We don't need a leader to move into our own areas. And that one's not yet controlled. So once it becomes controlled on the next turn or whatever, if we don't force the enemy out or destroy them, then it will be an enemy area. So anyway, that's just kind of a look at some of the different types of movement. And I think when I come back, I'm going to demonstrate a couple of battles. Fleet battles and uh, regular ground uh, land battles. Okay, the first thing I really want to go over is um, combat versus fortresses. I'm not going to use the siege artillery, but perhaps I may do that. Um, well, let's just see what siege artillery does before I... Uh, decide whether to use it or not. As an aside, fleets have no effect on any kind of land combat, just so you can't bombard that type of thing. Let's see, siege artillery, they move two areas per turn, they cost two resource points to build. When, effect, uh, when, effecting, when attacking a fortress, one factor of siege artillery equals 12 combat strength points. When defending in a fortress, or when involved in combat in any other area of the map, it's worth only one point. So, basically it'll give you 12 factors per strength point. Um, I will see. I'll set it off to the side and we'll see if the, the Royalist player needs to use it or not. They may not. Alright, so let's factor this battle. We know that the Parliamentarian player here in Plymouth is being attacked by the Royalist player in Hampshire. We'll say they captured it and it's theirs now and they're moving on <clears throat> to capture the port at Plymouth or Portsmouth. Oh, they should not have named ports with the same letter in the same area of the country. Anyway, and let's see. Let's go ahead and factor the defenders. We have a one Pikeman, one string pikeman that is in a fortress, so he is tripled to three points. So three points for a pikeman defending in a fortress will use the number one line, and he will be worth two combat points per string point. So we know he has a three, three times two is six. So we know that the defender has six string points behind the walls here. Now let's see what the attacker has. <clears throat> the attacker has two musketeers, two pikemen, and one cavalry. Um, this will also use, they will also use the number one line, or yeah, line. So we look over, we see pikemen are worth two, so we have two times two is four. We see that musketeers are worth four. They are four times two is eight. So what do we got? Eight and four, twelve. But let me double check something real quick. Yeah, I don't see where we can use line three, which has the equal numbers of pikemen or musketeers plus cavalry. So 
this has to be versus uh, the fortress line. Okay, whatever. 12 to, what I say? 3 times 2 is 6. 12 to 6. Uh, 4 times 2 is 8. Yeah, 2 times 2 is 4. So 8 force 12. We also have cavalry. What do they pr uh, provide? 1 strength point is 2. So we have 14. We have 14 divided by 6. That's going to be on the 2 to 1 table. Okay, we're going to be resolving that combat on the 2 to 1 column on the Fortress Assault table. I roll a die here. We get a 1. 2 to 1 on the 1 is... The results are read as the unit in the upper left hand corner is the defender and uh, the results on the lower right hand corner are the attackers. So a 1 at 2 to 1 produces a negative 2 or minus 2 for the defenders. And a minus 1 in the corner also indicates a minus 1 for the attackers. So coming back over to the actual battle spot, or battle location, we'll implement the results. So minus 2 for the defenders. That will eliminate our valiant parliamentarian pikemen. And we have to lose one factor from uh, the Royalist player. Um, I don't know what I really want to do because in any other battle we'll get the even up pikeman versus and musketeer bonus. So I think I'll eliminate the horse as much as I really don't want to. Oh, I also forgot uh, the effects of leadership. The pluses move the column that you determined at first, it moves it one column to the right. So that should have been resolved on the 3 to 1. Which would have been a lot worse for the, the attacker. Uh, let's see what the defender would have suffered. They suffer an R. Capital R. But the defender would take two, uh, or the attacker would have taken two losses. Let me look here just a second and see if we can't find out what that R means. The R, the R, the R. The R means this side is routed, and all units must immediately retreat out of the area into any friendly adjacent area which does not contain any enemy units. So looking at Portsmouth, we could have gone... That's part of uh, Hampshire over here, but we probably could have uh, went to Sussex. Um, let's see, but it's got to be worse than that. The enemy player captures the area, and if it's a royalist player, he would place a marker on there. The parliamentarian player would uh, remove a marker. In addition to all of this side's militia, in addition to all of this side's militia units being eliminated, um, three factors total of musketeer, cavalry, and pikemen in that order must be immediately removed if possible, one factor of each. So we would have to start eliminating basically pikemen if they were routed. So either way, the defender would have been destroyed. destroyed. I'll knock over my counters. And the attacker would have taken either one or two losses, depending upon uh, if I wanted to modify that. So let's say we did modify that. He already took one loss. He'll go ahead and take another loss in Musketeers. But they do occupy Portsmouth. And control it. So now it's an enemy-controlled area. Units will have to... Parliamentary units will have to use a leader to enter it. And so on and so forth. Okay, let's run a quick battle here with uh, parliamentarian units engaging the royalist units. The parliamentarian units are starting in Ham Hampshire, and the royalist player will be starting in Hampshire. <laughs> They're both uh, in Hampshire. Um, we'll say the um, parliamentary player moved into Hampshire to engage the royalists. So we're going to be fighting out in the open basically, no uh, no fortresses to hinder us. And this will use combat line two because it is 
all other areas. Get there where I can read it. All other areas and odd factors of pikemen and musketeers. Because I have, uh, where am I at? I guess I'm up here. I have one p musketeer and I have two pikemen, so I have, uh, they're imbalanced or an odd number. In this era, it was most efficient to have an equal number of pikemen and musketeers in your army. Um, they had reduced the pikemen in a unit and increased the musketeers in a unit to almost a one-to-one -one scale. I think this was occurring in, or occurred during the Thirty Years' War. Just prior to this, they were starting to move towards that type of configurations. Anyway, so we'll go ahead and factor this battle. The defenders in the, just a clear open area, like I say. So he is two factors of pikemen. He'll have a two, so two times two will be four. I'm going to die out here. Math is hard. <clears throat> okay, now we have the attacking player led by Fairfax. And yes, I will try to remember to add his bonus. He has two pikemen, which have a strength of two, as opposed to four if they were uh, an equal number of pikemen and musketeers. Okay, so we have a two. We have two times two. That's four. We have one musketeer. He is going to be a four. So there's eight. And then we have one cavalry unit. And he is a six. We would use the higher value of eight only if there was also... Well, we would use the higher value of eight. There's uh, Well, there's not an equal number. Well, just a minute here. Let's use our brain. Um, if we have odd factors of muskets and pike, we'd use the six, but using number three with equal factors, you get to use the higher numbers, and the asterisk is use the higher value on the cavalry table if there are any pikemen musketeer units with the cavalry. So that's an eight. It applies at both the second and the third case of combat. So I'm guessing that's an 8 per factor. So we have what? 8, 4, 12, and 4. So that's 16. We have 16 to 4. Um, what is that? 4 to 1? Bad numbers. Sorry. Okay, 4 to 1 on just the melee table. Plus we're going to push the table over 2 for Fairfax's plus 2 um, combat reading. So we'll be resolving this on the 6 to 1 table. So we're on the maximum column that we can use. And it looks to me like the Royalist player is going to be routed. And only a high or low die roll will affect uh, the Parliamentarian player. So 3... On the six to one, looks like it's a a win for the parliamentary player. It says in a rule book parliamentary, but I don't know if parliamentarian is a proper word. Also, if it even is a word, um, but it's easier for me to say parliamentarian than parliamentary. Anyway, he'll be destroyed because. Even if he had, well, let's wait a minute. Let's take the action. Let's move the camera back to where the action is. Somewhere in this area. The Royalist player, unless this place was, uh, this area was friendly uh, controlled, or that place was friendly controlled, he he um, could not re retreat or route or whatever route. So he would be eliminated. As in addition, he has to take three strength points, uh, strength points, not combat points. Um, sorry for hitting my microphone. Um, in a given order, um, in order to route, so he's eliminated. That means a parliamentarian player controls the area again. I would take the little marker off, saying the royalists had it, and. Um, these guys will all be happy here in Hampshire. So that is a basic look at how combat and movement work. Um, 
naval combat works so kind of the same way, I guess. Let's see here. What do we have? Uh, there's rules for the new model army and the Scottish army joining the um, parliamentary player. And we have Irish reinforcements helping out the royalist player, which you can prevent by gaining control of the Irish Sea and prevent him from receiving, the royalist player from receiving any re, uh, reinforcements from. Where is a port up there? Do they have to capture a port? They have to capture uh, Pembroke or something to have a port. I don't know. I'm not sure how that works. Devonshire? I don't know. I'm not sure where they received their reinforcements. May they have to capture uh, a parliamentary port in order to receive uh, Irish units across the Irish Sea. Anyway, fleet combat. Uh, let's see. They can be captured in a port. We use the fleet melee CRT. All combat odds are stated with the stronger side first. For combat odds greater than 4 to 1, use the 4 to 1 column on the fleet melee CRT. Um, let me see. I think they're just used by string points. I don't think they... Uh, yeah, they're just, they're just pure string points. So two fleet versus a two fleet would be 1 to 1. And there is no higher. No, one fleet doesn't. Because those tables um, say melee, the cavalry, and I believe the fleet all use a stronger versus a weaker um, results kind of a deal. So. Let me see here. Um, to resolve fleet combat, all odds are stated with the stronger side first. Well, what if they're even? Odds greater than one, use a four to one. At one to one combat odds, the combat results in the top half of the box are royalist. Uh, and the parliamentarian losses are in the lower half of the box. Only retreat results occur on the fleet or route uh, occur on there. Well, I guess I'd have to dig a little bit deeper into the um, how combat works. Well, I have to dig into fleet combat a little bit more uh, in depth. I'm not quite sure how you factor factor the various fleet points. Anyway, it's boring out on me. What have I got over here? Move my camera. Oh, that's much better. Anyway, that's the game Cromwell. Um, it's a fairly simple, light little game. However, the rules are poorly laid out. Very hard to find the information that you're looking for. And even when you do, it is kind of confusing and kind of poorly worded, I guess, um, to this day and age, and even back when it was made, back in the 70s, um, there was much better examples of rules writing and stuff, but um, overall, I like it. I will keep it in my stable of games um, for a while. I've only had it for a year, but I think I'll keep it around. I don't have a lot of games on the English Civil War, so... I do have the English Civil War by Aerial Games. I do have Power and Resolution by Simcan. I do not have the Card Driven Game by GMT. And I do not have the Clash of Arms game, All the King's Men, although I kind of would like to get a copy of that. Um, but anyway, I think I will take a break from English Civil War for a little bit. Move into a couple, I don't know. I'm not sure where to go from here. I am going to start playing Lobosits finally after it being on my smaller table here for eons and eons. Um, 
it's all set up and ready to go. It's like I said earlier, I believe it's part of the GDW Series 120 game system. 120 counters, two hours to play, that type of thing. Uh, so, with that in mind, I'm going to sign off here and move on to another game. I'm trying to work on my format still, so they're still pretty shaky and um, hard to watch. Kind of like some old rule books are hard to read. Um, like I said, I'm still trying to uh, work on uh, a format that works best for me. I spend more time behind the camera, it seems like, than I do playing the game, so I'm going to have to go for a more concise, less rambling um, type of video, I guess. But uh, anyway, I guess that's all the information I really have at this moment, and I will chat with you all later.